All right, hello everyone and welcome to this event. We're so glad that you all were able to uh, come today and get a sample of some of the virtual program that we've been doing. Um, we're so excited to welcome John Tai uh, to talk about the, uh, talk about whistleblowers and talk about some of the issues involved there. Uh, my name is Jake Mazetis, I'm with the American Constitution Society. A few quick technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to submit questions throughout, please feel free to use the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, and we'll be moderating those as, as they come in and I'll be asking those questions to John near the end. Uh, and in addition, if you'd like to claim one hour of California CLE credit for this event, please feel free to send us an email at lcemails at acslaw.org and we can get that process for you. So now we'll turn it over to David Seidel, who is the president of our at-large chapter to do our introductions. Thanks, Jake. I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for attending today's talk on how to help clients blow the whistle without going to jail. This virtual event is put on by the American Constitution Society at-large lawyer chapter, and we are really excited to have John Tai present today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker, John Tai. From 2011 to 2014, Mr. Tai worked as Internet Freedom Section Chief at the U.S. Department of State, where he held a security cl clearance to receive top secret information. During a classified briefing, he learned that the U.S. National Security Agency was using Executive Order 12333 as a legal loophole to collect, store, and search Americans' emails, phone calls, and online communications without a warrant or any suspicion. Instead of contacting a reporter or WikiLeaks, Mr. Tai paid two lawyers, including Mark S. Zaid, a total of $13,000 to help him navigate the, law, uh, the lawful reporting process. With his attorneys, he met with the Inspectors General of the State Department and the NSA, the House of Representatives Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the Senate, and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He also gave a public statement to the U.S. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. With the advice of counsel, he was able to publicize his allegations in a completely legal way. Following the government's pre-publication review process, Mr. Tai published an article for the Washington Post, and his complaint was covered by the New York Times. The Guardian, Vice, Ars Technica, and Wikipedia. He also gave a TEDx talk on the issue. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence commended Mr. Tai for, for using the legal reporting process to raise concerns while protecting classified information. Mr. Tai was named one of the National Security Law Heroes of 2014 by Just Security Blog. Mr. Tai remains bound by his obligation by his obligations to protect to protect classified information that he learned during his government service and also by his oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Mr. Tai graduated from Duke University summa cum laude, the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and from Yale Law School. Mr. Tai has worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Southeast Louisiana Legal Services as a Scadden Fellow. He was on the board of directors of the American Civil Liberties Union of Louisiana. In 2017, he co-founded Whistleblower Aid. Whistleblower Aid is a nonprofit that provides legal advice on how to navigate reporting wrongdoing lawfully and without disclosing or leaking sensitive information. As Whistleblower Aid's executive director, Mr. Tai is admitted to practice law in the District of Columbia in Louisiana. Mr. Tai also co-authors op-eds in such newspapers as the New York Times and the Washington Post about the importance of whistleblowing, Congress's role in protecting whistleblowers, and duties under the U.S. Constitution. Recently, he secured funding for both legal and security services for the whistleblower in the Ukraine matter that led to President Trump's impeachment. We are very fortunate now to have Mr. Tai speak to us all. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Tai. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm John. Uh, I am in South Carolina right now, uh, normally in DC, uh, but very pleased to be here. Uh, so I started Whistleblower Aid over three years ago. Uh, we've done a lot of cases over the last three years. I'll just share a little bit about <clears throat> our work. Uh, so we, we are, two of our founding lawyers were the lawyer for the Ukraine whistleblower, uh, and we provided all the funding and, and uh, legal support, security, and other things for that. Uh, we've, based on evidence provided by our clients, we blocked two different presidential nominees in the Senate in the last couple of years, one for the CIA, uh, a guy named Christopher Sharpley and another uh, William Bryan, Trump's nominee for Undersecretary at Homeland Security, who was actually 
still in the acting role uh, and was on stage with the president uh, when the president was talking about injecting people with disinfectants. Um, we, let's see, uh, one of our clients was the photographer at the Department of Energy who took photos of Secretary Rick Perry with a coal executive, Bob Murray, uh, that basically showed a, a, a corrupt intent with a coal subsidy proposal that went into the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, based on that evidence, we were able to get that proposal blocked and we are uh, still litigating <coughs> the retaliation case for our client on that. Uh, other things we've worked uh, with The New Yorker and Ronan Farrow on two pieces, one related to disclosures about Harvey Weinstein who hired a private intelligence firm called Black Cube uh, to follow around Ronan uh, and the Jody Cantor and the other New York Times journalists as well as uh, the accusers. Uh, and we, we represented the MIT whistleblower with evidence that, uh, of MIT's relationship to Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, we just started a partnership in Ireland, so we're expanding internationally for the first time. Um, have a lot of cases going on right now, uh, so happy to answer questions about uh, some of that. But the, the, the title of this talk is how to help your client blow the whistle without going to prison. Uh, and so a few thoughts with that. First of all, uh, why don't we take this I was thinking about how to structure this for this discussion. I was thinking we'll take the first half of this hour till say uh, 5.30 Eastern or 5.35 Eastern. Uh, and I'll sort of go through some of my thoughts and then we'll, we'll move into questions after that. So feel free to, to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and Jake, I believe is gonna be moderating those questions and feeding them to me when it makes sense uh, at the right time. So, uh, Look, if you're in ACS, you're probably a lawyer uh, and, and we, we are getting CLE credit for this. So I, I kind of want to walk through a kind of lawyer's eye view of the client intake process and how, how this works and the kind of things that you need to be thinking about if you want to represent whistleblowers. So uh, we'll break it down a, a few ways. We'll start off the things you need to be thinking about before anyone ever contacts you or walks in your office. Uh, the initial client uh, connection how that happens uh, and you know what you should be trying to do in that first meeting. Uh, and then of course, moving into uh, the details of legal representation. And with almost all of these whistleblower matters, there's always, uh, not always, but typically some kind of media or, or a journalist uh, angle. Um, most of our clients are motivated to try to get the word out about what they perceive as injustice or misconduct. Uh, and so clearly the media has an important role to play with that. Um, a few thoughts before we get in. Our motto at Whistleblower Aid is report government and corporate law breaking without breaking the law. Uh, so uh, we are very much trying to distinguish ourselves from other groups that do encourage law breaking. Um, I, I would say uh, we, we are here so that people don't have to go to prison or flee the country to try to follow their conscience. Uh, and they don't even hopefully have to put their career at risk. We're a long way from that, unfortunately. Um, but, but that is the goal and that's what we're working towards. Uh, and, and that's really part of our, again, client-centered approach, which is we're not pursuing an ideology we're not here to advance a particular political agenda. I personally was a, a, a whistleblower during the Obama administration. One of our clients who I didn't even mention, her name is Simone Grimes. She, we won the first Me Too sexual harassment case for her against the Senate confirmed official who is a holdover from the Obama administration. So, so we've been uh, going out you know, in, in terms of a political angle here, we don't have one. Um, we've been bringing disclosures against both parties and, and uh, both the Obama and the Trump administrations. Um, so, uh, so, so to get, to walk through this process, before you ever meet a client, you have to be preparing yourself and your infrastructure to handle a whistleblower matter. Um, so we, the, the most important thing is to protect the communications 
uh, even of people who don't know that they need to protect their communications and don't know how to do so. So one of the challenges that we've had to think of is how do we create a system where a stranger who we've never spoken to has maybe heard of us or whatever can contact us without putting themselves in jeopardy, knowing that we are likely targets. Uh, a, a little bit of background on that. I, I was, a, uh, I had, a, as, as David mentioned, had a top secret clearance, made disclosures about the NSA's collection on Americans. Uh, and briefly, this executive order 12333 had been set up before the internet and it said outside of our borders, there's less likely to be Americans data. And so the NSA and, and, and the other agencies have a very free hand to, to collect stuff. Uh, with the internet that's changed because every time you use Google or Yahoo or uh, any of the, I mean, okay, Cupid, any, any, uh, any cloud-based service of which most of you viewing this would use multiple, maybe dozens, that data is transiting outside the United States. It's being stored outside the United States and it's being collected by the NSA and treated as foreign person data in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, so, you, you know, uh, we do different times, types of cases. We do corporate cases, obviously universities and other things. Uh, government cases, US government, um, we've talked to local police, you know, whistleblowers and local police forces and DA offices. Uh, so a wide variety, and, and I have to emphasize the security aspects of this are very important, and they take a lot of thought, a lot of work, and a lot of money to really do it right. Um, you, you have to, you know, we don't know what people will be bringing to us, and so we have to assume every conceivable adversary who, who wants that information, some of whom are bound by U.S. law, uh, including the CIA and others, um, but uh, others of whom are not bound by US law or at least don't consider themselves to be like foreign intelligence agencies. So for instance, with the Ukraine matter, clearly Russian intelligence was very interested in what our client had to say and what their were plans were uh, and what they knew and those type of things. Uh, and so once you start dealing with foreign intelligence agencies, there's basically no rules and, and it's a very scary situation. So. Uh, so the, the point here is, um, you need to, you need to put a lot of thought and, and effort and money into creating secure systems. Uh, before I get to the sort of the, the, the technical details of what, what I would suggest, I'll say the U S, uh, you know, we, we, we still live in a, uh, a democracy that follows the rule of law. Uh, there have been a lot of challenges to that that make me very concerned over the last few years. Um, I do, you know, there's a lot of evidence, I mean, uh, you know, historically that organizations like the FBI and the CIA have violated U.S. law in conducting investigations on U.S. persons. Um, that's been politicized in recent months uh, with, with this stuff about Carter Page. Uh, you know, the fact is the FISA court does have a lot of problems and those are some of the things I, I was personally concerned of. Uh, so so uh, in general, I don't think that the senior people in those agencies would permit uh, those agencies to knowingly uh, you know, brazenly break most U.S. laws in terms of going after U.S. persons. But, but you should be aware of the contours. Um, it is possible for the FBI and other domestic law enforcement agencies to get warrants to uh, search lawyers' offices. It's difficult to do. It requires not only a federal judge to sign off, but typically someone at the very highest levels of the Justice Department, typically the uh, Deputy Attorney General of the United States. So, it's unusual. Uh, it does happen. Um, uh, it happened with Michael Cohen, the president's personal lawyer, the, the, the DAG signed off on that. Uh, but you should know that you could be targeted, depending on, on what you're working on, um, by U.S. law enforcement. Now, the CIA and the NSA are sweeping up most of our data because it's stored overseas. Uh, there are rules in place to stop them from using it in various ways. I think in general, they tr certainly the senior people, I believe, are sincere in trying to follow those rules. Uh, I, I, this is about over a year ago, I, met, I, I was meeting with a U.S. senator who was on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I won't use their name here, but 
uh, I, I had had randomly had about 10 minutes alone with this US Senator and I said, uh, how much, you know, and this person is on the Senate Intelligence Committee and is getting briefed by the agencies. And I said, uh, do you feel like you know, uh, th that you personally are aware of what these agencies are doing? Uh, and this person said, I don't think the directors of these agencies know what these agencies are doing. So uh, it's a serious issue. Uh, I, I do think that the senior people are committed to following the rules uh, in terms of investigating US persons, uh, but you, this is something you need to worry about if you're gonna be representing these whistleblowers. With that, um, so before, before you meet with a client, before you even advertise for this, you, you need to have some basic understanding of, of the security issues here. This isn't a cybersecurity uh, seminar, but there's, you can't be too worried about this is, is the short version. Um, I would say in general, you wanna do everything in person in hard copy with no phones around, no cameras around. Uh, anything can be hacked. Literally anything can be hacked. There is no way to protect data on a digital device. Uh, certainly if you're, a if you're a high value target for any intelligence agency, there's no way to protect it. And this is how the CIA has killed so many Al-Qaeda data, basically the phone numbers and the, and the device numbers that these people are using, even their family members are using. And as soon as it flips on and, and, and hits a tower, they send a drone and, 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 hit, the, and hit the device. Uh, so in short, if, 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 the, if the US government or an adversary knows your device, it's over. The, the only way to protect the device is to stop uh, your adversary from knowing that it's you using that device so that, that they wouldn't know to look at it. It just gets lost in the sea of the, the, the millions and billions of devices in the world. So, uh, all right, you should avoid digital devices, do everything in person, everything in hard copy. We have a typewriter, literally a typewriter that we type things on and use a photocopy machine that's not, you know, it's air gapped from the internet. Uh, we obviously use computers, I'm on a computer right now, you have to, uh, but, but it's not ideal. Uh, if you do have to do something, you should never use email. Um, email is intrinsically insecure. We now have free and very well functioning uh, digital uh, communications apps. The best one being Signal. Uh, many of you probably already use the Signal app. Uh, it's for iPhone and Android and it's widely used. Most, most lawyers and journalists are using Signal at least who, who work in this kind of area. Uh, you can make voice calls, you can send text messages, you can even send files, you can install Signal for desktop so that you can use it instead of email. And it, it creates an end-to-end -end encryption, uh, end -end encryption. So, so if, if you do have to use a digital device, which you're gonna have to do, use Signal. There's a lot more there, but I'm gonna move on. Uh, in short, you need a professional uh, to give you advice on this stuff and, 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 you know, burn the paper at the end because, uh, you know, if you've studied the, your fourth amendment class in law school, they can go through your trash without a warrant. So, uh, so, okay. That's the kind of thing to think about before the client meeting, when you're meeting a client, uh, and those first interactions, which are, you know, sometimes in person, but more often over a text message or phone call or something, uh, the most important thing here is that th these, people are trusting you with their most important secrets. Uh, for better or for worse, most of my clients, like my, the case I'm doing for them is like the most important thing in their life and they're terrified and rightly so because uh, there's not much you can, the, the, the laws are not sufficient to protect whistleblowers. Uh, so, so you should, we use aliases sometimes, we, uh, we do all kinds of things to help people feel more secure. So you need to be thinking, how do you build that trust immediately off the bat? Uh, when, when they try to email you, you, you force them to use Signal and you say, look, I know it's a little bit of a hassle, but uh, you'll thank me later. This, this, this is, you know, you, you show with your actions that you're committed to protecting them and, and you're not just out there sending emails and texts and tweeting about it or whatever it is. So uh, never use, Never use email, never use a, a regular cell phone if you can help it. Um, text messages are the least possible secure thing you could ever do. So don't do any of that. 
uh, you obviously need to figure out if this person has a claim. Um, in order to be entitled to whistleblower protections, they have to show that they have a reasonable good, you know, a reasonable belief in misconduct occurring. Uh, so the, the, scale, the, scale, the scope of possible whistleblower matters is extremely large. Like I said, companies, Wall Street companies, tech companies in California, meatpacking plants in the Midwest, uh, every agency in the US government, state and local governments, police and prosecutors, we, we can't possibly cover it all in, in this short time that we have. But, uh, you know, conceptually, there's out of government cases where uh, they'll be covered by, you know, typically state laws and any kind of policies that the employer has. Uh, plus, then in government cases, which are governed uh, by this process called the U.S. Office of Special Counsel uh, and the, the, something called the Merit Systems Protections Board, both of which are supposed to hear these complaints from civil servants with disclosures and, and retaliation. Uh, uh, so it's sort of an administrative, you know, a, a normal administrative law body. Uh, and then, then obviously there's classified national security information. And that has its own extremely complicated system that we're not going to have time to get into. But anything involving classified information, you should be extremely cautious. You should never let your client give you classified information. If they start to tell it to you, plug your ears. It, it, don't let them tell anyone this classified information. They can almost always find a way to convey the import of it without actually, uh, you know, oh, oh, this involves US military operations in this country that you can, they can say that without getting in trouble. But any, you know, if they talk about names, if they talk about locations. Yeah, so, so John, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but that actually brings up a, an interesting question that I've, I've really never thought about. I mean, we usually think of the attorney-client relationship as being so sacred, you know, sacrosanct that the, that the client can tell their attorney anything and it's completely privileged. But in this context, uh, you know, uh, and in this context, the, 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 you know, the top secret information would be part of the representation, but you're saying that even that would be would be a violation, and that would make sense. I'm, I just never well, thought. Well, uh, here's the, the the legal subtlety. Um, you still can invoke attorney-client privilege and decline to testify against your client. So, if your client tells you something that's classified, and then the government tries to call you as a witness to testify against them, you just say it's privilege, attorney-client privilege, but if they can prove through other means that they told you classified information, like an email that they sent to you that the government has, that person's still going to go to prison. So, so yes, you, you can't be compelled, compelled to testify against your client, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Sorry, I'm going to take a step here. Well, thank you for the question. Um, so, All right. Uh, th so, so, so the first thing you're deciding as you're, you know, listening to an inquiry is, do they have a reasonable belief in misconduct that they're seeing? Um, you know, obviously, if, if if anyone has practiced law, people come in all the time with, you know, something either that they're very angry about or something that is morally wrong, but you know, there's not necessarily a legal solution to their problem. They don't have a, a claim upon which relief can be granted or whatever it is. Uh, so, so we get those a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people just hate their boss and maybe their boss is a jerk, uh, which, you know, th that boss should probably be fired, but they don't, they're not a whistleblower who has, um, you know, a, a legal claim. So you need to establish that, that there's some responsibility that, that the executive or the official or the agency or the corporation had and, and didn't follow. Um, I mean, it could be a US law, a regulation, it could be an ethical rule, it could be financial misconduct, stealing money, money disappears, not enough accountability for the money. Like, I mean, there's obviously a huge range of possible misconduct people could be reporting. Um, uh, and you need to, you know, the, the very first analysis is does, if what they're saying is true, does it violate something? And sometimes it's just this person was lying, which, which, which itself 
you know, lies are not illegal, uh, but we could still argue that they're misconduct, um, you, you know, under certain things, especially out, outside of government. Uh, and once we get into the court of public opinion, those kind of lies, even if they're not breaking a law, um, can be something that they can get you a lot of traction. So, so that's the first thing you're doing. The, the next, if, if they pass that test, the next thing is how do we get them whistleblower status? So typically, the, the law, you know, this is one of these areas where the laws say anyone with this reasonable belief uh, is entitled to do these things, but you want to go, you want to check all the boxes so that there's no doubt in anyone's mind that they have met the thing. So you don't go first to a reporter, you go first to the established process that the agency has laid out. You go first to the inspector, maybe the chain of command, the inspector general and Congress, and then you go to a reporter, not even because you think those first three are gonna do anything, but because you need to show that your person is a, is a legit whistleblower who's entitled to the protections. And, and if you do those first things first, before you go to the media, then everyone agrees that they're a whistleblower. And if, and if, you know, if they're not breaking the law when they go to the media, because it's not classified or you know, whatever, um, then, uh, you know, then, then the client's in a much better position. So, so you need to figure out what are, you know, and it's different in different states, different corporations, even different agencies in the U.S. government. You know, every one of the 17 U.S. intelligence agencies has their own rules about how to handle classified information and what you can do to get to Congress and stuff. So it's very, very complicated. The, uh, but but the, the general thing is what, you know, what do you do to get them whistleblower status? Step three would be protect the evidence. So, you know, a lot of people come in, it's like something that they heard, something that they saw or they witnessed. Um, any lawyer, you know, uh, who's worked, uh, you know, would know witness testimony is never as strong as documentary evidence. So, you know, emails, files, videos, photographs, that kind of stuff. And we see that with these police misconduct cases where, you know, a, a lot of times that there are literally thousands of cases in this country where you have multiple, two or three people saying this police officer did this thing wrong. Uh, but if, you know, if it's just their word against the, you know, a couple of police officers, there's not enough to proceed. But once there's videos, as we just saw this week in Minneapolis, uh, it's inarguable and, and you get a lot more uh, movement with that type of evidence. So, uh, you know, clearly you need to help them protect the evidence before it's deleted because there's often attempts to delete the evidence, find a way to safe keep it. I mean, I have a client who had a classified PowerPoint that's evidence. Uh, he was instructed to delete it. So instead uh, uh, found a way to, to submit it to an inspector general to keep it from being destroyed. So you know, you have to come up with creative ways to preserve the evidence uh, without breaking the law. You can't take classified files home with you. And if you're going to break an NDA that you signed for your company, which people do all the time, and, 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 you know, you have to give people, the clients, those options. Well, you sign this NDA, um, you know, if you break it, they could try to sue you. Um, but, but, you know, it would look very bad for them if you're, you know, so, you know, it's up to you and you, you obviously have to let the client make the final decision about how to do those things. You, you, you don't help them break the law, but, but they're going to make the final decision uh, on, on what they're going to do. And sometimes, you know, people make decisions we disagree with and, and, and we either have to live with it or withdraw from representation sometimes. Uh, so, sorry, I'm going to keep moving here. It's 531. Uh, legal representation. Uh, the last kind of point I, I, I want to discuss before we open it up for questions is uh, journalists in the media. Um, when we were starting this, people said, well, well, to, to go back a few years, the, the context for this was you have Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden making these huge leaks. They're saying, well, I Snowden especially, I tried to follow the procedures. The procedures were inadequate. So I, this was my only resort. And he has a point. The procedures are not adequate. And 
um, there's a whole bunch of reforms I would love to see. The counterpoint is you had the Obama officials saying, uh, you know, he's a traitor, he's a criminal who, who didn't, uh, didn't bother following the rules uh, and the rules would actually have worked here. I, uh, I'm not gonna get into my own personal views on this stuff. I will say that, uh, you know, they're right that he didn't do everything he could have uh, to, to, uh, to try to follow the rules. Uh, so we are here to, uh, you, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Snowden's goals in the sense that uh, I also disagree with the scope of US signals intelligence collection. Um, you know, we're here to say, well, the rules, the existing systems may not be what we want, but they're the best we have and we're gonna use them as well as we can. And they actually, if you know how to use it, it's more powerful than you might expect. So um, again, as I said, if you go through that first part of the lawful process, if you have a lawyer, they take you more seriously. I mean, that's the very first thing. I mean, anyone who's ever always get a lawyer when you're dealing with the US government, no matter what. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, go, you know, do what I said, go through that process, Meet, notify your chain of command before or after you notify the inspector general. That's typically, if you do that, if you find a way to do that, uh, it makes it actually harder for them to retaliate against you because then it's not uh, you surprising them with something, it's they know you're a whistleblower. And, and, and so you can use you can use the exposure and the going through the process to protect the client. Um, so, 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 so do those things. And then when it comes to classified stuff, you can litigate under FOIA, you could submit something called mandatory declassification review requests to each agency where it's not actually the agency that adjudicates whether something is properly classified. There's a separate board interagency board that, that does, and, and they actually declassify over 50% of the requests that come in, often over the objection of the, the source agency. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's an option that most people don't know about. You can also do what's called pre-publication review. Uh, and this is more powerful than you might think. I, this is what I did in my case. I, uh, I had this idea that, um, what the NSA was doing is wrong. I had seen a document, but then, you know, I, anyone who's ever been in a skiff, the, the agencies don't let you keep the documents. I mean, they, they let you read it and they take it back 20 minutes later. And so that's, that's what I had. I, I had just seen something and, and I didn't want to break the law. I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to leak classified information. So uh, what I did was I wrote an article about my under, you know, what I had learned and I submitted it for pre-publication review. Now, then that's forcing the government to make a choice. Do they want to redact things in which, A, you can publish it redacted with the words blacked out, and then, uh, then everyone's asking, what the heck did the government redact? Or number two, you can sue them to get it unredacted under the First Amendment in federal court, and you know, the government doesn't want to litigate that kind of case because e even if we lose the case, you now have a bunch of journalists asking, what is the government fighting so, so hard to protect? So, so pre-publication review can work. And in my case, they, I, I threw in everything and they, they let it go because I don't think they wanted to fight me on it. And it got published and then it got attention to this, uh, you know, to, to, to this issue of the NSA surveillance. That strategy for someone who, who doesn't have, you know, uh, can work in, in, it's hard, it takes months. You have, sometimes have to litigate like, it's, you know, it's not easy and fast, but um, it's a way to protect the client. And then if you do it that way, then, then the government can't come after your client. Um, the, the one last little example, I had gotten a, a doc, okay. I had seen those classified documents, I gave them back. Um, I wrote my article, article for pre-publication review. While I was at state, I got a document from the White House over the unclassified email system. Um, Lay, it basically proved my point that the White House knew about this and whatever. The point is, is that it had, cut, it had been marked unclassified by the White House. I received it on my unclassified system. I, before I left, I shredded all the documents in my office, like hundreds of thousands of pages, you know, everything. 
but this one I wanted to take because it showed my point, it was unclassified. But the government can even try to prosecute you for uh, theft of government property for stealing like five pages of paper, which are you know worth what a, a fraction of a cent. Um, but but that would be the kind of thing that they could try to throw at you. So so what we did was uh, I had a friend who worked on Capitol Hill for a U.S. representative, excuse me, well member U.S. member of Congress, and. Um, we, we, I gave the document to them while I was still employed at the State Department, uh, which is perfectly legal and ethical and it's part of what Congress's job is to receive disclosures from federal employees. Uh, and then, uh, I, so then when I left state that day, I didn't take a single thing with me. I didn't take a single piece of paper or anything. Uh, and then a few weeks later, I went back and got the document uh, and then was able to share it and use it. So this is a perfectly legal, ethical way to get the document out of an executive agency um, without subjecting myself to some kind of uh, accusation that I had stolen anything or anything like that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of creative ways to go about these things if you're interested and, you know, you have to be creative and, and all that. The last thing on the media, um, the, uh, Historically, whistleblowers have gone first to journalists, and, and obviously there's lots of amazing journalists who have played such a crucial role for decades, and especially the last few years, in holding the government accountable and showing when there's been abuses of power. Uh, you know, you have to be careful with journalists because their interests are not always aligned with the client's interests. Uh, you know, journalists regularly, you know, we've seen back during the W. Bush administration, um, New York Times journalists going to prison in contempt of court for refusing to give up their sources, which is admirable uh, for the journalists. Um, but it usually doesn't come to that. Usually a journalist will make some kind of mist mistake uh, that, that gives away their source without even intending or anything like that. Um, and you know, the journalist's incentive is to publish. The, the, the information is useful to, useless to them unless they can publish it. Uh, so that's where, where a lawyer comes in. We can protect things with attorney-client privilege and we have ethical responsibilities, not to the best news story, but to the client. And sometimes that means not sharing these disclosures and we will not share. I have disclosures that I will not and have not, will not share because it's not in the client's interest to do so, even if they're newsworthy. And so, um, you know, we partner with journalists all the time, um, but, but it's something that you have to, uh, you know, be very careful with. So uh, I think that covers kind of the, you know, start to finish of a lot of these cases. Um, and as I said, I guess the last point on the journalists is the, sometimes, you know, uh, as lawyers, we're taught about these burdens of proof, right? So uh, you have beyond a reasonable doubt, preponderance of the evidence, sub substantial likelihood, abuse of discretion. What do these terms mean? They all at different levels. And when you make internal disclosures, those, those standards always provide some ambiguity where the receiving agency, if you're giving it to an inspector general, always has discretion about what constitutes um, clear and convincing or, or substantial likelihood or those kind of things. Um, but that's where the, the, the media can, can play such a role is because even if it doesn't, you know, reasonable people can disagree about whether the evidence meets that standard, it, it doesn't matter because the public outrage on this is, is significant. And so you'll get like, like that's how a lot, you, we've seen this time and again, where the, the IGs will sit and do nothing for months or even years until there's like news coverage. And then all of a sudden they spin up and, and start doing this stuff. So it's clearly a motivating thing for, for these government agencies uh, and, and, and obviously private companies. Everyone's concerned about their public image. All right, it is 541. Uh, I'll call it there and happy to have Jake ask uh, some questions. Absolutely. John, thank you so much for, for that really insightful kind of overview. We have a few questions, both from my own prerogative, just things that I noticed and some coming in from the audience. And 
David, if you have anything, please feel free to jump in as well. Um, so I'm curious, kind of, you talked earlier about how there are kind of generally threats to the rule of law uh, and to whistleblowers specifically. I'm curious if you think these are unprecedented in American history or if there are other times that we can look to where threats to the rule of law and whistleblowers specifically have been as significant as they are now. I was talking to a friend of mine today about this. I mean, uh, I would say in our lifetimes, th this is the most serious threat. Um, but this country, you know, had slavery for the first, what, 70, 80 years of its existence. Uh, and then, you know, a system of legalized segregation. So. Uh, compared to that, uh, you know, more people are voting now than 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 pretty much any time before. Um, so, so there are some positive things about our current situation that we shouldn't forget. Um, and you know, the, the 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 Red Scare, you know, after World War One, and then McCarthyism. Uh, these are very serious things that destroyed a lot of people's lives. And there wasn't really freedom of speech. And, and the FBI was uh, trying to convince Martin Luther King to kill himself. And, uh, you know, so there have been a lot of very bad things throughout our history. Uh, Andrew Jackson, you know, led a, basically a genocide of uh, war crimes against Native Americans. So, so I don't want to make light of those things by saying our situation today is worse than that. Th th those are clearly horrible things. Um, you know, with that said, I, I think we've all been disappointed to see that um, the, the, how fragile the institutions today are. Um, I, you know, uh, you're reading about this stuff on the newspaper every day with uh, things like trying to change the sentencing of Roger Stone or, or let Michael Flynn go after he pled guilty twice. Uh, you know, those type of things are not um, consistent with a rule of law. They obviously suggest political interference in the administration of justice. Uh, and, you know, that type of thing, uh, even things like calling foreign leaders and asking them to investigate political opponents, I, I've never heard of that happening in the history of the United States. So uh, it is a very serious time, certainly uh, in our lifetimes, you know, probably the most serious. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think to an extent, uh, we can move on to another. So part of what makes ACS really phenomenal from my perspective is that we have a lot of students as well as lawyers. And so I'm curious if you could, um, for students on the line and students that may watch this later, talk about how someone might get engaged with whistleblower protection work, I think, especially considering how much it's been in the news lately, there might be some interest among some of our law yeah. students in getting engaged in the work you're doing. Well, look, I mean, we, we would love to uh, bring people on. Uh, anyone who can work for free, uh, we would love to have them. Uh, we're trying to raise money to hire more people, so we'll see. Um, the, you know, I would say one of the reasons we started and we've had so much interest in the last three years is that there hasn't been an infrastructure on a lot of this. Uh, to date. So there have been a couple of, uh, th there's, there's various law firms that do whistleblower work, but they, uh, you know, they typically charge clients on an hourly basis, or they do stuff on contingency only in cases where you can make a lot of money, like these SEC disclosures to the C Securities and Exchange Commission, where if you work at a financial firm or a, a, a publicly traded firm, you know it's breaking the law, not paying it taxes, something like that. You can report it to the government and get up to 30% of uh, what the government recovers from the company based on your evidence. Uh, so, so that's what, you know, those type of law firms have sort of been around for a long time. Um, you know, there's a couple other small uh, NGOs that, that do, uh, you know, direct legal representation pro bono. Um, and we're all under-resourced and under-supported. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, it's, so on the one hand, there's not enough uh, resources and money to, to pay for all the work that needs to be done. On the other hand, 
if you're thinking of you know a, a legal career, I think it's a very interesting and important legal career. I think the the value of whistleblowers are going up every day, and I think that over the next you know five and ten years, we're going to see a lot more money and resources flowing into this area because people it's finally like hitting people like this is so important for our democracy and for these other things and so you know i think it's a growth area uh so so we don't have all the money we need today but i certainly think we're going to you know be be raising that in the years to come so uh sure get in touch we'd love to have you perfect um this next question i'm, I'm curious at deals a little bit with whistleblowers, but I think taking a skill that you use in the whistleblower space and applying more broadly, which is this idea of digital privacy. So you've spoken a lot about yeah. how you keep the work that you're doing private. I'm curious if you have tips uh, for folks more broadly. I know that I spend all day emailing back and forth with people, um, nothing, nothing too exciting, but tips for folks to increase kind of their digital security within their own lives, even if they're not necessarily engaged in whistleblower protection work that you've gleaned from your time uh, working in this field? Well, uh, segregate the data streams. So uh, have one personal account, have a work account. You know, we, we have different devices for every case sometimes. So uh, don't be mixing that stuff and, and try to, you know, paper devices and cash, d d like don't create a digital trail so that people can follow uh, y y or figure out that you're using one account and then all of a sudden get all this other thing on a, on a particular case. Um, we use, well, we use, we use different devices for different matters. I, I have multiple computers, multiple phones. Um, we use data hotspots. We're, 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 using VPNs, virtual private networks, we're encrypting everything where uh, everything you can use uh, a, uh, a an operating system called Cubes, Q-U-B-E-S, which is considered the most secure operating system uh, in the world. Perfect, thank you. I'll, I'll be sure to, to mine some of those for my own, my own personal use. Um, so another question kind of about the work specifically, it, it seems as you've kind of overviewed these questions that you develop these, these very intense, you're working in a very intense environment. Uh, and so I'm curious in this space kind of that relies on privacy and, and dare I say secrecy, how do you find clients and, and advertise your services? Yeah, well, when we launched, we just ran ads in the DC Metro. We had these big billboards in the, train cars, half of the train cars report government law breaking lawfully with our, you know, our, our secure address, not the regular web address. Um, and we had giant billboards, billboards as big as a wall, uh, you know, on the back of flatbed trucks driving in circles around the White House and the Pentagon and the CIA and uh, other agencies. Um, we were handing out, we, we handed out 12,000 whistles with our little card attached to commuters coming out of the metro. We started advertising on Facebook and LinkedIn and Google uh, to people who work at different agencies. You know, you have to be careful with the digital advertising because um, you don't want people accessing it at work. Uh, so, so we've tried to take those precautions. Um, but yeah, you know, starting with paid advertising uh, and then, so hold on here. Uh, and then obviously when we've had media coverage of the cases uh, that's brought more people an interest in it. And a lot of just, you know, word of mouth, friends of friends of friends kind of thing, so. Yeah, so J Jake, you've already uh, gone through a couple of the questions on, um, that have been asked. I see another one that, that has come up. Uh, somebody asked, could you discuss the ways that minority status can interact with the client's decision to whistleblow? Yeah, well, uh, typically my minorities are in a more vulnerable position in multiple respects. Uh, it's very much a case by case thing. Uh, you know, I, I've never interacted with Chelsea Manning, but clearly Ms. Manning was struggling with, uh, you know, a transition, a gender transition during the period that she was leaking these things. And that clearly was, you know, uh, again, from the outside, it, you know, it, it looks like that 
she needed uh, assistance uh, with that and was, you know, again, based on the, the reporting I've read, was struggling with that personally, in addition to all of this legal and political stuff. Uh, so I would say we, well, first of all, uh, it can trigger more retaliation or, or, or differential treatment, as we all know. Um, and so it's something that we have to talk about with the client. I've, you know, I've had conversations saying, we have to reach a meeting of the minds with the client about how that kind of issue is affecting their case and how they want to handle it in public. Um, you know, uh, I, I, without going into detail, I had a minority female client who was being sexually harassed by a minority male man. And she said, well, uh, he wouldn't try this with a white woman. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, that in her mind was a factor uh, that we had to figure out how to, you know, how to handle and how to message, you know, uh, it, it's a difficult thing. Um, so in short, we would provide, we don't just do legal stuff. We, under the DC rules of professional conduct, um, we can actually pay people's rent if they've been fired illegally. And we've done that. Um, we can provide psychological counseling or medical treatment or whatever. And we've, we have set people up with therapists. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not a trained therapist. Obviously, I, I, I listen to my clients, but, you know, at some point I'm like, look, I, I, I can't help you here. You need a doctor, you need a therapist. Um, or, or we need to talk about how do you want to message on, on these kind of issues, which are very sensitive for everyone involved, for the victim, for the perpetrator, for, uh, you know, clearly if there's any media coverage, that's going to be, it's important to, 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 to figure out how the client wants to handle that. Um, so I guess what I would say is it, you know, it raises more complications that we, we talk through on a case by case basis. Thanks, John. It's incredibly interesting. I have one question that struck me early on. You mentioned that you had a, a case working with someone at MIT. And from my understanding, MIT is a private entity. So I'm curious what, if, unless I'm, I'm fundamentally misunderstanding the case, what it means to engage in whistleblower work outside of a strictly governmental sense. Yeah, no, there's lots of private sector whistleblowers in every kind of company. I mean, financial companies, as I said, if you work at a financial firm or publicly traded firm and you know your, your firm is breaking the law, you can report them to the SEC and get up to 30% of whatever fine the SEC recovers based on your evidence. If you know that your company, any company, any taxpayer is, is breaking the law and not paying their taxes, you can report them to the IRS and in theory, you can get up to 30% of whatever back taxes the IRS recovers based on your evidence. Uh, so, so those are or if you're, you work at a defense contractor and you know the defense contractor is ripping off the Pentagon, same kind of thing. Um, so, so clearly there's lots of private sector whistleblowers who, who are covered under various statutes, some federal statutes, some state statutes, some corporate policies. Um, the, in that case with MIT, uh, you know, our client was Signe Swenson. You can read about her case. Um, and she had evidence that the head of the MIT Media Lab had been misrepresenting his relationship to Jeffrey Epstein and the money they'd raised from Jeffrey Epstein. And we helped her tell her story in a lawful way uh, that got the story out while protecting her. And, um, you know, so, so every case is different, but, but for sure there can be whistleblowers inside private institutions. Great. Uh, one, one other question, John, uh, John and, that, and that's that, you know, we, we, you talked about how doing this legally a big, a big part of that, obviously, is not disclosing confidential or, 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 or uh, uh, top secret uh, information. Um, so is there ever a situation in which you have a client whose whistleblowing claims are wholly dependent on top secret classified information? And, and, and ultimately, if, yeah. if you go through the uh, declassification requests that don't work and, and other factor, uh, other, other ways to try to get around that, ultimately you might have to say, you know, at this time you really can't do anything. We can't uh, make these claims. Now Unfortunately, yes. I mean, there's always more ways to pursue it lawfully. Um, certainly that, that uh, I would say it's more, 
it's never that we run completely out of options. It's that at some point, the risk to the client uh, is too much and they, they, they don't want to pursue it anymore, in my experience. For sure, though, I, you know, it's very easy to imagine, and I've experienced situations where a client, sorry, how can I say this? With top secret disclosures, has tried repeatedly to bring them to Congress, uh, and Congress said, uh, we can't let you into the SCIF where, where you can give us the classified disclosure without running your badge against the agency list, which would then notify the agency that you're meeting with us. And yeah, so they're, they're stuck. I mean, it, it, it's not good. They're, this is one of the reforms that needs to happen. And we're, we're, we're you know, working on that kind of thing, but you know, uh, it's slow going, as you can imagine. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much. And it looks like we're at the end uh, of the hour. Um, that was a great presentation. Really appreciate it. I wanted yeah. to let people know that they can find more information about John's uh, nonprofit at whistleblowerAid.org. WhistleblowerAid.org. Yep. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot, John. I really appreciate it. Also wanted to let everyone know that you can get CLE credit and um, the way to do that is in the chat feature in this Zoom call. You can email uh, LC emails at acslaw.org. There's some instructions in the chat in case you want to get CLE credit. And then also just wanted to let you all know that um, the ACS at law, or excuse me, the ACS at large chapter is also putting on uh, a great event on June 24th um, in, in honor uh, of LGBTQ month uh, at 1.30 p.m. It's going to be a, a fantastic event. You can register for that at events.acslaw.org. And with that, uh, unless there's anything else, just want to say thanks, everybody. And thanks, John. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thanks, everybody.